The Purging of Rouen, Abridged, Episode 5. He got out, brushed himself down, shook some dirt from his ear holes, and rounded the front of the car. The bonnet was stuck, and he wrestled with it for some minutes before the dervy popped it open from inside the cabin. The engine, Oscar said when she joined him. I think it's broken, and I think it should be shinier. The distributor's all dusty, she said, through a mouthful of crispy scales. I'm sorry. She pointed at bits of engine. The distributor's all dusty. Oscar still didn't understand. Her lisp was bad enough, but when forced through a half-chewed mouthful of crispy scales, she made about as much sense as the animal who first decided to eat blue cheese. Perhaps, he said, but I'm certain it should be shinier. I'll find a cloth. The dervy shoved the bag of half-devoured crispy scales into his paws and thrust hers into the tangle of engine. With a wrench and a spit, a curse and a twist, she removed something and wiped grease from it. With another spit, she then put it back and suggested he try again. Oscar returned to the car, wondering how spitting soggy, crispy scale into an internal combustion engine could be considered constructive, especially when doing so only detracted from its shininess. But when he turned the key, the car coughed, spluttered, and pulled itself together into a rattling rhythm of waiting. Oscar sat back, impressed. Having secured the bonnet, the dervy offered an oily paw through the window. The dervy, she said. My friends call me the dervy. Oscar took her paw and returned it, as was the custom. Oscar teabagged Uven, he said, and hesitated before admitting, and I don't really have any friends. She blinked at him before limping to where his scarf lay on the road. She untied it and brought it back. Well, Oscar Teabag Duven, saving an animal's life is a jolly good way to start. Realising he had indeed done this, he stared at her. Maybe his incessant self-doubt could spend some time doubting itself for a change. The dervy hobbled to the passenger side, saying, If you don't mind, I think it might be best if you drive. Although agreeing unreservedly, Oscar needed to relieve himself before any return journey. Under the circumstances, it was remarkable that he hadn't already. Leaving the car rattling quietly, he made his way up an embankment to find a suitable place. He squatted, sighed and waited in that order. Breeze, scented with grasses and sea, played across his earless openings, and he wondered whether in a strong wind his head might play a tune. Warm sun brought everything beneath to simmer in spring headiness, and despite its recurring autumns and insane residence, he realised how beautiful this part of the world was. But he then noticed something that he hadn't seen during the panic of rescue, and so surprised was he that he almost ended proceedings with an inadvertent clench. Towering high above him, upon a pinnacle of rock, was a castle. It struck at the sky as though having been belted from the earth and soared above land and sea. Its walls teetered upon a precipice that left little room for anything other than wizened and daring points of tree. Its parapets were as sharp as thorn, having whittled the mountain down to an immense point of needle. And above it, flocks of birds wheeled, leaving it to be a crown upon a crown. His perilous stance left Oscar in awe, and in a shower of dust and stone he scrabbled down the embankment and back to the car in a manner suggesting things had not gone according to plan. Did things not go according to plan? the dervy asked. Ignoring her, he pointed up at the fortress and asked, What on earth is that? She followed his stabbing paw. That is the castle of Rouen. Against high sun, Oscar sought its heights again. It's beautiful. Who lives there? No one, silly. It's the ruin. It has been for centuries. There must be some animal living there. What could possibly make you think, though? Well, look at all the birds circling above it. Surely there aren't that many birds around a deserted ruin. The dervy shrugged. Well, it's quite impossible to get to, she said. The cliffs are almost vertical all the way around. There may have been a bridge or a staircase of some thought once, but not any longer, and certainly no animal that I'd there now. 
Then why all the birds? I don't know. They've got to nest somewhere and I suspect it's convenient. She nodded toward the mountains. Perhaps the rangers are just too pointy. Oscar found the suggestion so ridiculous that silence seemed prudent. She got into the car and Oscar followed. And finding a gear that still worked, he used it to perform a 37-point turn. Such was his dislike of cliffs. Having nursed their car back to Rouen, Oscar pulled up at a bar neither knew. In it, he ordered an assortment of beverages to lessen the odds of receiving a dreadful one. Oscar didn't like bars. He quite liked the music, providing it was quiet jazz, but he didn't like their smell. Unfamiliar confidence with a strange hint of plead. He avoided bars religiously, which was odd considering he liked cafes, and he spent a moment pondering the difference, which he concluded was due to the former having stools. He didn't like stools. They were either tables trying to be chairs or chairs trying to be tables and their indecision left him uneasy. When the dervy planted herself upon one, Oscar climbed upon another, holding the bar for stability. He'd have preferred to write poetry and browse libraries than talk to strange animals in strange bars, and he wasn't convinced that talking to an animal as peculiar as the dervy would help any more than visiting cafes had the day before, especially when surrounded by stools. You're a peculiar animal, aren't you? he said. The dervy watched him gripping the bar. What do you mean by that? He shrugged, as it was pretty obvious smearing feces on walls and trying to take out an entire city's council before hurling oneself off a cliff was hardly normal behaviour for any animal. So he said as much. She scoffed. I have my reasons, and anyway, I didn't hurl myself off the cliff. My brake failed. Oh, he said. I didn't realise that. It certainly explains a great deal, though I slowed down when it became obvious you were going too fast. Well, now you know why. Oscar nodded. Even so, it wasn't he who went around misspelling words with appalling grammar in his own manure. So why had she been at the police station? Their drinks arrived. He took a sip of hot fin. It was revolting and he tried not to gag. You were turning yourself in this morning, he said, wiping his chin. I jolly well was not. And because she didn't question the fact, Oscar could have had no clearer confession. This animal was responsible for the second autumn. Why in fluff would you do something like that? He asked. She looked at him before tenacity crumbled. After burying her face upon the bar, she began to cry. Oscar glanced around uncomfortably, not knowing what to do and the animal behind the bar offered little more than indifference. He nudged his hot fin toward her. You can have my drink, he said. It's really quite revolting. But she shook her head before burying it deeper. Honestly, you're most welcome to it. It's like eating soggy soap off a plug hole. Her shoulders jumped. After some deep breaths, she looked up, wiped her whiskers and took a napkin he offered. And you thought I was strange she said. Then we perhaps have something in common. The dervy looked away and took a sip of her drink, which seemed agreeable. What happened to your ears? she asked. With a familiar plummeting of self, Oscar was then the one needing to hide. A paw rose to where his ears once perched. It's a long story, he said, wishing to leave it there. Why? Did they come off slowly? No, they did not, he said. It happened very fast, very painfully, and I don't want to talk about it. Taking a swig of hot fin to make the point, he forgot how revolting it was and sprayed it across the bar. The animal behind it produced a cloth and mopped it up with such lethargy, Oscar was left wondering whether having concoctions heaved back at him was an all too frequent occurrence. Were you being brave again? The dervy asked. No, not really. I just didn't realise it was the same drink. No, I meant when you locked your ears. Oscar sighed. Look, I was just trying to help another animal and it got complicated. So you were being brave. I was just doing my job. What is your job? Well, but he stopped then, preferring to ask the questions. Look, he said, I want to help you, the dervy. Really I do, but I need to know why you felt it necessary to do what you did last night. 
What in fluffiness pushed you to such an extreme? The Dervy's eyes went from a glow to blackness then, and he realised he had to offer more. I know of animals who sympathise with your frustrations and are eager to help you before more animals get hurt. She scoffed. I have plenty of friends like that. Perhaps, but I doubt they are members of Rouen's ruling council. She fell silent then, though her expression remained defiant, wanting to believe him but suddenly weary of this fight. Who are you? She asked. He took a deep breath before admitting, I am Oscar T. Bagduven, a velvet paw of Asquith, on Curiosa here in Rouen. Oh, you're not! She cried, pushing him in amazement. Expecting surprise, but certainly not assault, Oscar flailed upon his stool. He teetered, toppled backwards and fell, lunging at drinks on the way down. He crashed to the floor where he remained sprawled for some time, soaking up beverages like a conveniently placed sponge. With a paw over her mouth in dismay, the Dervy leapt from her stool and joined him. Apologising profusely, she removed the receptacles adorning him, admonished her clumsiness, raved about his prowess and finished with an excellent dissertation on the fundamental flaws of stool design. With her help, Oscar scrabbled to his paws. Offered a cloth by the bartender, he dabbed at himself, before realising it was the same cloth used to mop up his recent hurl. With a sigh, he stood in surrender, wet cloth in one paw, empty glass in the other, while the dervy picked off wet bits of grass and a slice of lemon from his fur. There's no nobility in admitting to being a velvet paw if it's followed by toppling from stools. Such admission requires a certain dignity. Are you hurt? the dervy asked. But only my pride. I'm sorry, but I was a little overexcited. I knew there was something different about you. Indeed said Oscar, trying to recover decorum through diction. Taking the slice of lemon from her, he left it pointedly upon the bar, along with the little ball of grass she'd found in his fluff. He also left the cloth, but not before wringing it out pointedly also. Is it really true? You're really a velvet paw? Of Asquith, yes. That she had little trouble accepting the fact pleased Oscar, and went some way to negating his acrobatics. Their composures and stalls restored, the Dervy said, I want it to be true. Goodness knows Rouen needs your help. To be quite honest, I've had rather enough of this unrelenting struggle. She took a deep breath and began. Up until five years ago, things were tolerable for animals such as me. Rouen has always had restrictions about when and where young animals might congregate, but over time it has become quite ridiculous. She looked at him, but he said nothing and waited. After Rouen's rise in popularity came a wave of animals of all ages. I think it was simply too much for Rouen too quickly. The ruling council was desperate to find a strategy to maintain Rouen's quiet seaside character. You seem quite understanding of such predicament. Of course. To be quite honest, I agree with them. I have lived here all my life and would hate to see Rouen succumb to common mediocrity. But there are ways to preserve character. Ways that are not so maddeningly discriminatory. So you're saying the ruling council has become too harsh? The Dervy nodded, partly in answer and partly to dislodge some grass still caught in the fluffy bits around her ears. And to certain animals in particular? Oscar asked further. Yes, to any animal younger than they. In recent years, they've made a point of closing down all venues for young animals. And two years ago, they implemented a curfew permitting no animal to be out after nine. Oscar frowned. You don't feel by any chance that your acts of resistance have exacerbated the disparity? Possibly, but I cannot sit by and see friends deported without protest. And anyway... Our protests have only ever been about inconvenience and disruption, rather than intentional harm. Well, your fumigation last night was rather more devastating than smearing poo on a wall. The Derby's face fell and she looked away. That horror was never what I intended. Oscar nodded, realising Horace was right. Then what in fluffiness made you perform such an act? 
Her eyes were wet when she met his again, their glistening amber full of plead. One of us was so certain such severity was warranted. He compelled us to build that which was unleashed. Her gaze fell. I fear a step has been taken that can never be retraced. Up until last night, we toyed with her tempers. Now I suspect there's nothing left to toy with. Oscar reached for her paw and patted it. You have been incredibly naughty, the Dervy. But fortunately, other than singed whiskers, stripped sinuses and an astronomical cleaning bill, no animals lost their lives. But her gaze remained upon the floor. I can help cease this attrition, the Dervy. And I think you know more than any animal that this needs to end now. Remembering the pajamis' viciousness, he added, It must end now, before all bedlam breaks loose. The Dervy looked up, grateful but concerned, both realising it was likely that bedlam had already arrived and was wandering around Rouen making itself familiar, finding good cafes, working out bus routes and generally getting its act together. Oscar needed to restock his collapsible tummy with supplies from his hotel room, if they'd survived the horror, while the Dervy wished to witness the aftermath of the second autumn as a sort of self-chastisement. So behind the wheel again, the cats headed for Hotel Drouen. Whenever they turned left, the Dervy stuck her paw out the window, which Oscar found increasingly annoying as it was his window. What on earth are you doing? he asked. Indicating which only had him asking again. She said, You need to indicate which direction you want to go in. I thought that's what the steering wheel was for. She looked at him in disbelief. Have you ever actually driven a car before? Well, of course. When? Shrugging, he said, Well, this morning. A horn blared at them, and an animal yelled obscenities in their wake. While the dervy waved apology, she asked how he'd managed not to have an accident. To which he replied he was quite happy leaving such things to her, as she'd already proved herself amazingly capable. Arriving at Hotel Drouen, Oscar pulled up in a squeak of tired brakes and cut the engine. Spluttering in relief, it died, its days of conveyance now well and truly over, which left Oscar relieved. Of the three of them, the car could easily have been the low survivor. The hotel was in a terrible state, and they watched a horde of luggage-laden animals flee, sobbing down at steps. Don't worry, Oscar reassured her, imagining how she must feel. We'll get this mess sorted out. Despite the second autumn, he sensed a goodness in the Dervy, especially when compared to the pyjami.